Good morning. Welcome to the Cove. I'm glad you braved the little bit of rain that's falling. Glad you made it in safely. Um, we are in a series talking about courageous living, and at the same time, we're talking about living in the promises of God. And at the same time, we're going through the book of Joshua. And so well, week one, we talked about securing the future. In week two, we talked about uh, being strong and courageous. Last week, we talked about meditating on Scripture, which was a powerful uh, message. If you, have, if you weren't here, haven't seen it, haven't heard it, uh, check it out online. It's very, very powerful. And today, we're talking about keeping your word. Keeping your word. Back when I was really, really young, I made a decision not to drink alcohol, not to do drugs, not to smoke. Now, I wish that I could tell you that this was some deep spiritual decision that I made, that I had a Mount Sinai moment when the angels ah, sang the hallelujah chorus and all that. But it wasn't deeply spiritual for me when I made that decision because I made that decision before the age of eight. And the reason why I made that decision is because it was a natural decision for me. In my parents' house, in my grandparents' house, there was no alcohol, there was no cigarettes, there was no drugs. And so me making this decision was just a natural thing. And then I became a Christian at the age of nine. I was baptized on July 4th, 1976. So when the country was celebrating 200 years, I was celebrating being born again. It was a Sunday, believe it or not, July 4th, 1976. And I figured in the first eight years of my life, since I wasn't an alcoholic and I wasn't a druggie, why would I dive into alcoholism or drugs or start smoking at the age of nine when I was trying to follow Jesus. But again, it wasn't a big spiritual decision. It was just kind of a, a logical thing for me. Then at age 16, God called me into the ministry. I know exactly where I was. I know exactly how it happened. He called me into the ministry, and our youth group was talking about the, at that time about our influence that we have on others, how important it is to think about how we live our lives and how that influences others. In fact, they use the scripture talking about if you lead a little one astray, um, it's better for you to tie a millstone around your neck and be thrown into the sea. And so I took that very seriously. And so I started thinking about my decision not to smoke, not to drink, not to do drugs and how it impacted other people. And I, I just kind of thought that it wouldn't be a good thing um, to influence other people in the wrong way. Now in high school, I was offered uh, marijuana and uh, cigarettes. And it just didn't occur to me to say yes, so I just said no. And in all honesty, it wouldn't have been very good for people to put pressure on me. It wouldn't have worked because I'm very bullheaded and I'm very strongheaded and I didn't have a strong big need to be cool in high school. And so I never did really face a tremendous amount of peer pressure in that regard. So fast forward, going to college, went to Bible college, no drugs, no alcohol, no smoking, at least not where I was at. Um, and then get married. Susie had the same commitment as me. Um, we didn't drink. We didn't smoke. We didn't do drugs. Um, there were times when we would be out in public or private when our friends would enjoy a glass of wine. No big deal. Didn't bother us. Or a beer. Or we got offered it at a retirement party or a wedding. Just said no. It wasn't a big deal. But then my kids were born. And I felt this need, when I started to play golf, I felt this need to smoke a cigar. Okay, I don't know what it is. I don't know how the two are connected. And so uh, I decided to tell my mom that I was thinking about smoking a cigar. And she did the typical mom thing of an adult kid. She did not overreact, which is really good that she didn't. But she asked me a question. And it's not what I wanted to hear, but it's what I needed to hear. She said, what do you think it's going to be like when your girls see you smoke a cigar? I'm like, hmm. So now there's this shift that happens in my decision. This is when it actually became a spiritual decision. Because I recommitted myself to God not to drink, not to smoke, including cigars, and not to do drugs. It was a decision that kind of morphed from just a natural decision to... Uh, a personal decision to a decision that impacted other people to a godly decision, a decision that I made um, for him. Now, it's important that you know that it was very, um, I thank my parents greatly for how they established their home environment without these things because I have addictive tendencies. My personality has a tendency to get 
obsessive, compulsive about certain things. I mean, I was one who opened up the Christmas presents, my Christmas presents, two weeks early to play the Space Invader game. And I also opened the batteries that went with the Space Invader game, played it for two weeks, repackaged it all together every time I played it every day, and no one knew the difference come Christmas morning. Now, I confessed that when I was an adult, but no one ever knew, because that was safe to, to confess that in, in adulthood, but no one ever knew. So I'm so thankful that it wasn't present. And I'm not telling you this to brag. And, and I'm not telling you this because it makes me more spiritual than a Christian who has endured those things or gone through those things. I'm telling you these things because this is a decision in my own personal life that relates to the three categories that we're talking about. Keeping your word to yourself, keeping your word to others, and keeping your word to God. Now, I have a confession to make. There still is a draw, I have a draw, no pun intended, towards tobacco smell. I've always enjoyed it, even when I was a kid walking down George Street. There was a, a store in Old St. Augustine that had hanging tobacco. I absolutely enjoy the smell of that. My grandfather, my late grandfather, he worked as a treasure for a cigar, leading cigar company in uh, Tampa. But I never saw him smoke. I don't believe he ever did. But he would bring home those cigar uh, boxes. And I have still a couple of those. And I open them up and I just breathe it. it, it just, it's attractive to me. Um, but I've decided on this side of heaven that that's not for me. Now, I will tell you this. If in heaven there are tobacco fields, oh, I will be taking the class on how to roll one and how to enjoy one. And if in uh, heaven they serve wine at the great feast, I will have my first glass, preferably red. Just saying. I think it's going to be red for me, not white. Now, how about you? How about you and some of the commitments that you've made? What commitments have you made to yourself, to others, or to God? When you told yourself this year, 2019, was going to be different, that, that you set in motion some New Year's resolutions, are you keeping them? Are you doing what you said you were going to do, and are you not doing what you said you weren't going to do? When you said you were no longer going to spend money on the credit card, how many times have you thawed them from the freezer to break them out or take them out of the safe? Or have you not spent money on credit cards? Are you true to your word? When you say you're going to give up cannolis, and let me tell you, that's, I'm never going to say that, okay? I'm never going to say, it's never going to come out of my mouth. This body over the last nine months has been produced largely eating two cannolis a day, okay? And I just told Susie this week, I said, you know what? I need to write a book. I can cannoli, you can cannoli, we all can cannoli and lose weight. That's the name of the book. And so, no lie, two cannolis a day. And I figured it out this morning, let's see, if it's six months, two cannolis a day, 30 days, like 360 cannolis, okay? And so uh, I'm not going to say I'm going to give it up. You, you, you can pressure me. You can, you know, twist my arm. You can waterboard me. I'm not going to say I'm going to give up cannolis, okay? But what have you said that you said you were going to give up or do or not do? Have you kept your word? And then when you gave your word to your kids that you were going to take them to Disney World. Did you take them to Disney World last year? Or when you told your, your child that when you got home from work, you'd throw the football. Did you throw the football? When you tell your boss you'll have the report on Tuesday, does he have the report on Tuesday, or does he have to go searching the office for you on Wednesday and Thursday, and you're like nowhere to be found because you don't have the report done? Can people trust what you say? And then when you gave your word to God, God, if you just get me out of this, if you just let my parents not find out, if you just let my kids not find out, if you just keep this from my spouse so I don't have to plan my own funeral, I will fill in the blank, whatever the blank is. I will tithe, I will be in church for the next 12 Sundays, I will pray more, I will deal with my anger, I will give up, whatever. Have you kept your word to God? Do you keep your promises? Do you keep your commitments? When you give it, are you true to your word? Well, let's get back into this conversation regarding Joshua. Let me set the stage for you. Joshua is getting ready to cross the Jordan River. His plans are in three days he's going to cross over. There's 12 tribes making up uh, Israel, and this is a big task. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. There's livestock, there's children, there's the army, there's the civilians, there's all this stuff. They've got to get it across the, the Jordan, and this is a big undertaking. 
And so he's getting ready to have this conversation. They're going to get ready to have some battles. But there are two and a half tribes on the eastern side of the Jordan River. The tribes of Reuben, the tribes of Gad, and the tribes, half tribe of Manasseh that inherited lands on the east side of the Jordan River. Now it's time to keep their promise. The promise they made to themselves, the promise they made to others, and the promise they made to God. What promise was that? They told Moses in Numbers chapter 32, you can check it out yourself, that we want this land for inheritance. And Moses said, basically, Tedric translation, what, are you scared? He said, no, this is fertile land. We need it for our occupations. We want to stay on this side. Moses said, okay, since you're not cowards, I'll agree to it. However, this is what you need to do. When it's time for your brothers to fight for the land, you got to send troops to fight for the land. And so now it's time to move in, and it's time to fight for the land. So we enter into the discussion, Joshua chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the midst of the camp, and command the people, prepare your provisions, for within three days you are to pass over this Jordan, to go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God has given you to possess. And to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, remember the word, That Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But all the men of valor among you shall pass over armed before your brothers and shall help them until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as he has to you. And they also take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and shall possess it. The land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise. And they answered Joshua, all that you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your words, whatever you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous okay so there's the promise that they made it's time to bring that due two and a half tribes they send forty thousand soldiers who are going to fight on the front line now this is what the division of the land looks like i got a map up here for you you'll notice on the right side of the map manasseh gad and reuben that's the part that They've already achieved, they already have that as their inheritance, but they're getting ready to cross the Jordan. And right about in the middle of the screen, you might not be able to make it out, but right above the Dead Sea, just to the left, is Jericho. That's where they're crossing. They're getting ready to cross because their first battle is Jericho. And you see how the land is divided from the other nine and a half tribes on the left or the western side of the Jordan. These tribes made a commitment originally with Moses, and now that commitment is due. Even though it was years earlier, now is the time. So they send these 40,000 soldiers and they're going to fight on the front lines. They're not like way in the back making coffee. They are on the front lines. So many of them know that they probably won't make it home. But breaking their word to their families, breaking their word to God, breaking their family to themselves was of a a, a greater disaster to them, a greater loss than not backing up their word. They needed to back up what they said. And so they committed themselves, we'll do what we said. Even to the point of death, if someone rebels against you, Joshua, we're going to put them down right now. That's how strong, that's how powerful of a commitment their word was. Now, I know that we live in a day and age where our word doesn't mean the same as what it used to. It's supposed to. For me, it does, and I hope that it does for you when you give your word, but our society doesn't do very well when we give our word. But that's what we're talking about today. If we want to live a courageous life, if we want to live a life in the promises of God, we have to keep our word. We have to keep our word to ourselves. We have to keep our word to others. We have to keep our word to God. So let's talk about this. Let's start with keeping our word to ourselves. Now, listen, you are probably in a world of hurt right now in your life if you don't keep your word to yourself. Because very few people enjoy life. Very few people have a fulfilling life who can't trust themselves. 
You have to be able to trust yourself. When you say you're not going to do something today, you have to be able to trust that. One of the worst things I think that can happen in life is that you tell yourself you're going to do something or you're not going to do something, and you turn it into a lie because you don't do it. You do just the opposite. You can't allow that to happen. Okay, You have to back up your word. You have to move heaven and earth. You have to do everything you possibly can to keep your word to yourself. Can you trust you? You're probably in a big mess right now if you can't. And if you can't, you have to change that. You have to change that. Joshua and uh, the Israelites, Gad, Reuben, Manasseh, they trusted themselves. They gave their word very early on, and they were able to keep that word. And so I want you to be able to do the same thing. If you're going to live a courageous life, life in the promises of God, you're going to have to be able to trust yourself. Then there's keeping your word to others. Keeping your word to others. Did you do that? thing that you said you were going to do when you gave your word to others? Did you go to Disney World? Did you do that report for your boss? Did you take care of that? When you said you were going to be on time and be there at 2 o'clock, were you there at 2 o'clock or did you show up at 2.15, 2.20 like you normally do? Can other people trust you? Now, there's people in my life that um, every, everything that comes out of their mouth, I put it in a basket. And the basket is entitled, that ain't ever going to happen. Okay. There's a lot of things in that basket, but everything out of their mouth goes in that basket the moment they say it because all they do is talk. They never walk it. And so I know for a fact it's just going to be in that basket of that ain't ever going to happen. And the reason the basket is called that ain't ever going to happen is because that ain't ever going to happen. It's very simple. My, my, my brain works very simple. Now, there's people in my life, too, that are 50-50 people. You know what? You probably have some of those in your life. 50% of the time, they tell you they're going to do something, and they back it up. And the other 50%, they tell you they're going to do something, they don't. They also go in that basket. Because let me tell you why. At age 52, I only have a certain amount of energy. The older I get, the less energy I have. You know, I'm, I'm slowly grinding to a halt. I can see it coming. It's happening. And so I'm not going to get excited the way I did when I was young. Woohoo! you're going to do this. You're going to do that. You're going to do this. And I'm going to run over here and run over here. And I'm going to give encouragement and expectation and woo I've got hope for everybody. I don't do that anymore. Especially if, if, if you're in that camp of 50-50, go get them, but I'm not going to be your main cheerleader. You're going to have to find someone else because I've only got a set amount of energy because you're probably in that basket of that ain't ever going to happen. You need to become a person of your word if that's you. If you're a that ain't ever going to happen kind of a person, if the people in your family can't trust what you say, you need to slow your speech down. You need to think about what you're going to say and the commitments that you're going to give before you give them. Now, my oldest daughter was going to be here. She's sick today. She's not going to be here. My granddaughter's in town. My uh, youngest daughter's here today. And I was going to tell you that you could go up to them and you can ask them about their dad. When they were young, growing up in the house, even now you can ask them how he is now. When their dad said, this is the way it's going to be, just ask them whether or not that's the way it was. Because they will tell you, if my dad said it, that's the way it was going to be. He meant what he said, and he said he was, said what he meant. That's why we never told our kids when they were disobeyed or there was a disciplinary action. We never said, listen, you're going to go to your room for three weeks, and you're not going to have dinner the whole entire time. Because guess what It would have happened? If I would have said that, they would have been in their, week, their room for three days, and I would have had to double up on lunch and maybe a little extra breakfast because they would not have gotten dinner for three weeks. So I was very careful with what I said because I back up what I say. And I hope that you do too. Then it comes to keeping our word to God. Now this is pretty self-explanatory, but I want to throw some scriptures at you. The first one comes from Numbers chapter 30 verse 2. It says this. If a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Pretty self-explanatory. Then there's Deuteronomy chapter 23, 21. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay fulfilling it, for the Lord your God will surely require it of you. 
and you will be guilty of sin. Self-explanatory. Then there's Ecclesiastes chapter 5. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin, and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? Wow. For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity, but God is the one you must fear. Wow, all those scriptures are pretty self-explanatory. Now you may say, well, last week, Tim, you said that we're you know, not beholden to the Old Testament in terms of how we're not underneath the Old Covenant law, and you just used three Old Testament scriptures. Yes, I did. And I did it for a reason. I could have picked out some ones in the New Testament, but I didn't for a reason because I'm going to lay another layer on what I said last week. We said last week that Jesus said in Matthew 22, all the commandment, all the laws hang on these two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Keeping your vows to God has to do with loving God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, with all of it. So this is a Old Testament principle, yes, an Old Testament law, but has a New Testament principle overhang to it it is a principle that we must keep to love god with all of our heart and soul mind and strength so we want to keep our word just like the reubenites gadites and the half tribe of manasseh did we want to keep our word when we make it to ourselves we want to keep our word when we make it to others and we want to keep our word to god so how do i bridge the distance between where i am today i'm over there and where i need to be where i want to be tomorrow or next week in other words what's my next step of faith when it comes to keeping my word well we're going to go back to school here for a second on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate yourself in terms of keeping your word to yourself? Now, we'll use 100 as a perfect score. 98 to 100 is an A+. Plus, okay? Now, I know nowadays, you know, they don't give zeros anymore. 50 is the lowest grade. You know, what's happening in school that you can't get a zero anymore? I mean, I got plenty of zeros. Not. But... I gave plenty of zeros when I was substitute teaching and you know, when I was teaching high school Bible when they didn't turn in their, their work. They didn't get 50% for not doing anything. So 1 to 100, we'll scratch off the zero. So how are you doing with keeping your word to yourself? If you're not in the A-plus category, if you can't just all of a sudden say, you know what, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an A-plus, keeping my word, then you've got some homework to do this afternoon. This is what I want you to do. I want you to grab a pen and a paper, and I want you to write all the commitments that you've made to yourself, all the ones that you can think of, all the ones you can remember. Check off the ones that you've done, and then all the ones that are still left to do, I just want you to take one this week. I want you to take one this week, and I want you to fulfill it, take care of it. Now, if it's one that has to take, you know, over a week, a month, a year, whatever, then you need to start. You need to start because you need to keep your word to yourself. And then there's your promises that you've made to other people. Same thing, on a scale of 1 to 100, where do you fit in that scale? If you're not an A+, plus, you got homework to do. Same homework. Write your commitments down that you made to your parents, to your children, to your friends, to your boss, whoever. Make all those commitments down on a piece of paper, write them all down, and then mark, scratch off the ones that you did, and take one of the ones that is still left unfulfilled and take care of it. Do it this week. And the same thing with God. If you're not in the A-plus category, you need to write down your commitments, check off the ones that you have done, and fulfill one of the ones still left to do. What would happen in our church if all of us, if all of us became a person of our word where we could trust ourselves, other people could trust us, and God could trust us? What would happen? Think about that for a minute. If we were all A-pluses, and that's how we lived our lives. That's how the community saw us. That's how our friends, that's how our family saw us. That's how our spouse saw us. That's how, how our kids see us. We fulfill what we say we're going to do. That's how God sees us as a keeper of our word. You see, our past promises should impact our future actions. What we've said in the past should fuel what we're doing in, in the future. Now, it may cost us more money because let me tell you, 15 years ago, you told your kids you were going to take them to Disney World and you didn't. Listen, them tickets have gone up in price. So it may cost you more money. You may have to talk to the credit union to get a personal loan out before you go because them tickets are well over 100 bucks. It may cost you more time. It may cost you more energy. It may cost you more effort. It may mean more emotional capital. It may mean that you have to humble yourself to go back and say, you know what? I told you I was going to do this. I feel absolutely awful about 
that this, I totally forgot, I didn't do it, I haven't forgotten, I just chose not to do it, I'm sorry, please forgive me, I want to take care of that now. Get it done. You know, in, in prepping this sermon, there's one thing that I, that I know of, now listen, if, if you know of something else, you have my permission to come tell me, but there is one thing since 2010, since I've been here, there's one thing that I told someone that I was going to do that I didn't do. And I told him I was going to send him an email about something. And he texted me when it was due. He says, I didn't get that yet. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, I totally forgot. I'm going to go up to the church and do it now. I've got my, it's on my computer up there. He said, no, no, don't worry about it. You can get it to me tomorrow. I said, nope. I told you I was going to get it to you today. And I'm going up there. And I think it was like at 930 at night. And so I drove up to the church, got what, why? It's because I said I was going to do it, and I forgot, and I asked him to forgive me. That's the only thing that I can think of. So I try to live my life in such a way that I back up. But if I promised you something and I didn't deliver it, you have my permission to come talk to me today, this week, and let me know because I want to make good on that. Because we need to become a person, if we're going to live a courageous life, if we're going to live a life in the promises of God, we have to become a person that you yourself can trust. We have to become a person that other people, that the people around you can trust. We have to become a person that God can trust. Just like the Gadites, just like the Reubenites, just like the half-tribe of Manasseh, when they sent those 40,000 troops in, you know that some of those people didn't come back to enjoy their inheritance. They died on the front lines doing battle. Because it was a, several years of fighting to, to conquer all that land. Many of them did not come back. But they lived a life of courage. They lived a life in the promises of God and in their promises as well. And we need to as well. It brings honor and glory to Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray.